I'm Ryan Crocker, uh, Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2016 Bank of America program on volunteerism. And we're delighted that uh, John Anderson is here tonight with um, his wife Anne, representing Merrill Lynch Bank of America, and for making this uh, program and so much more uh, uh, possible for us. Uh, I'd also like to welcome um, uh, my colleague, uh, Warren Finch, the director of the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum. Um, uh, another colleague, um, Bob Chadley, is here, uh, the uh, head of the Department of International Relations in the College of Liberal Arts. And again, welcome to all of you. This uh, uh, program tonight is going to be uh, important to all of us. Um, volunteerism is central to who we are as Americans. Uh, that's, that's always been what has set our society apart from basically the rest of the world. We, we volunteer. Uh, at a time of declining budgets, volunteerism has never been more important than it is now. Uh, uh, Government doesn't do it all anymore. It doesn't even do most of it. And um, stop the presses. It isn't going to do any more anytime soon. Uh, which is why at the Bush School we have um, an increasing concentration on uh, nonprofit management. And, um, uh, and now more and more with international non governmental organizations covering both the domestic and the international arenas. Um, so tonight's program really bridges both of our departments. Uh, so you'll be hearing uh, uh, in the course of the evening from uh, Professor Robertson from the uh, Department of International Affairs and Professor Brown from the Department of Public Service and Administration. But nonprofits and NGOs can't do it all either, or they certainly can't do it without volunteers. Uh, uh, paid staff using um, uh, federally generated funds are, are, are necessary, but they're not sufficient. Uh, and there is not enough money in the world uh, to fund all that needs to be done for societies around the world. Uh, that gap has to be met by, by volunteers. So we're really fortunate to have um, Bud Philbrook here, um, uh, the founder and CEO of Global Volunteers, uh, who has taken that basic American instinct and organized it into something that's really, really effective. That, that's what you'll hear about tonight. Um, uh, so for all of you who are thinking of volunteering, uh, there'll be a sign up outside. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you'll come out of here knowing that it's, it's not just our great instincts as Americans, it's our great ability to organize those instincts into something that is uh, hugely beneficial for our society and societies around the world. Raymond. Thank you very much, Dean Crocker. Howdy. Before I get started with the introduction, I first of all would like to acknowledge the hard work of Lori and Jennifer and Cindy from the Mosbacher Institute who've done a fantastic job pulling everything together. And I just want to make sure that we acknowledge how wonderful uh, they are and how important they are to us. I also feel especially pleased tonight to have this chance to introduce what I would consider to be one of the brightest lights in the stars of the sky uh, and to welcome Mr. Bud Philbrook here to the Bush School of Government and Public Affairs. Mr. Philbrook is a lawyer, and he served in the Minnesota House of Representatives and was assistant commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Then in 1984, he founded, co-founded Global Volunteers, which I'm sure we'll hear a lot about tonight. But that was identified by USA Today as the granddaddy of the short-term volunteer movement. Over the last 32 years, Global Volunteers has engaged more than 32,000 volunteers in 34 countries across six continents. It currently holds consultative status with the United Nations. 
He took a break for a while from serving as CEO of the Global Volunteers to serve as the Deputy Undersecretary for the United States Department of Agriculture in Washington. He was responsible for food security and international trade issues. He was also a novelist. His recent novel, Conclave Conspiracy, has received much acclaim and is very thought provoking and I've read it myself and it's a wonderful read and I highly recommend it to all of you as well. But after his novel tour, he returned to Global Volunteers with a very important focus. Global Volunteers currently focuses on helping pregnant women and mothers grow sufficient food and nutrition, protect themselves and their children from infectious disease, and ensure quality education. This comprehensive approach that they've been taking and advocating is based on the United Nations Essential Package. I'm extremely proud and honored tonight to welcome my good friend, Bud Philbrook. Thank you, Raymond, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Ambassador Crocker and Dr. Taylor for inviting me. I appreciate that very much. And thank you to the Bank of America for doing this uh, wonderful event. Um, Raymond uh, mentioned that I'm a lawyer. And you know, any good lawyer worth his or her salt knows a good lawyer joke. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you about an engineer. This engineer died and due to a com computer glitch was unfortunately sent to hell. And when St. Peter first learned about this, he immediately called Lucifer on the red phone, told him of the error, and instructed Lucifer to send the engineer up. Lucifer said, no way, this engineer is great. He's devised a, a sprinkler system that's helped put out some of the fires down here. And he's even installed an air conditioning system in my office. There's no way we're sending him back. Peter said, you know who decides, we decide who goes where. When Lucifer refused again, St. Peter said to Lucifer, if you don't send him to me, I'm going to sue you. And Lucifer said, and where are you going to find a lawyer? <laughs> My apologies to the other lawyers in the room. <laughs> Tonight I wanted to address the challenge of long-term comprehensive development, human and economic development, and why short-term volunteers are a vital resource in that effort. There are many issues that confront the global society today. There's terrorism, war, uh, religious intolerance, racism, climate change, but I submit that the human and economic development may well be the most important challenge that the world faces. And the reason is because all those other issues uh, combined are affected by poverty, ignorance, and disease. And if we could just eliminate poverty, ignorance, and disease, we would have the intellectual resources necessary to help combat these other issues which seem so intractable. Volunteers play a vital role in our society. Volunteer firefighters, volunteers who serve their churches, their mosques, their synagogue, volunteers who help disadvantaged children. Volunteers do so many things and they're so important to our society. But tonight I want to present to you an additional role for volunteers a role which doesn't just sustain our society, but could, within a generation, forever change the future of our planet. So first, I'm going to share some statistics that help describe the magnitude of the challenge. And second, I'll explain that governments actually know what to do to address the challenge. They just don't know how to do it. They're unable to do it. And third, I'll explain how each of you can be a part 
of the solution. The Food and Agriculture Organization reports that today there are 800 million hungry people on the planet. Let me put that in context. That's equal to the combined populations of the United States, Western Europe, and Canada. 300 million of those are children. The UN estimates that 3 billion people live on less than $2 a day. $2 a day. How is that even possible? Well, for many it isn't, especially children. UNICEF reports that 7 million children under the age of 5 die every year from preventable causes. That's 19,000 a day, one every five seconds. Let me put that in context. Tonight, during this event, 1,000 children will die from preventable causes. Before breakfast tomorrow morning, 10,000 little kids will be dead from preventable causes. But death is not the only adverse result. The World Health Organization reports that 26% of children in the world are stunted. That's one out of every four. One out of every four children on the planet is stunted. And stunting diminishes cognitive ability and, 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 and interferes with educational performance. Because stunted children's brains don't fully develop. Now, the first thousand days of life between conception and the second birthday are the most important. The brain develops rapidly during this period. In fact, when you were born, 87% of your metabolic energy went to developing your brain. By the time you were two, 90% of your brain was fully developed. So think about that. While fetuses are growing fingers and toes, and infants and toddlers are learning how to walk and talk, 75% of their metabolic energy is going toward developing their brain. But fetuses, infants, and toddlers that have insufficient food and nutrition and protection from infectious disease, they suffer significant impaired cognitive development. Their brains do not fully develop. WHO states that stunting, if it persists to the second birthday, is most often permanent. Children that are stunted struggle to learn. And if they cannot learn, they cannot earn. So everyone suffers. Countries with average population IQ, low IQ, by definition don't have all the intellectual resources they otherwise would have. The tragic result is that countries therefore have less intellectual resources to improve their quality of life and their GDPs are negatively affected. Net net, the cycle of poverty recycles. This is how impaired child cognition works to keep poor countries poor and underdeveloped. But it's not just the developing countries that lose out. The rest of the world is denied the lost genius. The creator doesn't decide who gets mega IQs based upon race or ethnicity or religion or country of origin. But genius is linked to hunger and disease. If a child's brain cannot fully develop, his or her genius will not be realized, regardless of where they're born. So the whole world loses out. We all lose, because there are fewer George Bushes. There are fewer Carrie Marcuses, Norman Borlaugs, Barbara Jordans, 
Robert Moshbachers, Dolores Wirtas, Dale Evans. Left unabated, this challenge will dramatically affect our children and our children's children. The multitude and magnitude of the issues facing our world today will, without a doubt, become much more complex in the years ahead, especially as world population grows to 9 or 10 billion, mostly in developing countries. We need every resource that the Creator offers. We cannot afford hunger and preventable disease to steal even one child. Ensuring that every single child gets all their IQ points and cognitive ability is necessary for the continuing progress of humankind. Whether we want to develop lasting nuclear fission or photocopy the human heart or f travel from New York to London in an hour or uh, cure, uh, develop therapies and medicines that will cure uh, mental illness. All of the brain power we have on the planet, the more likely we will be able to accomplish all of these and so much more. But you ask, what can any of us do about this? 800 million hungry, 300 million children, 165 million stunted, Three billion living on less than two dollars a day. Ten thousand little kids dead by morning. These numbers are so humongous. They are so large. They become mind-boggling, mind-numbing, almost meaningless. Sometimes, you know, our brains simply give up due to the enormity of the problem. Because how could any of us hope to be able to do anything to address the magnitude of such a massive challenge. Well, the really interesting thing is that as massive and as overwhelming as it appears, we actually know what to do. During the past 30 years, scientists, economists, politicians, and development community have come to realize that we can break the cycle of hunger poverty and disease. We can end stunting in developing communities in the US and around the world. And this is a nonpartisan issue. President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama have both spoken on this issue and committed resources to it. The global community now possesses all the knowledge, all the technology, to ensure that every child can live a full and productive life. Every child can be healthy, attend school, be educated, learn self-discipline, and become a contributing member of society. The United Nations has come up with a very effective formula. It prescribes that developing countries provide 12 interventions to help ensure that every child can realize their potential. Now, Global Volunteers took the liberty of taking those 12, reorganizing them, creating this symbol, or this image, to help people get their arms around them, and we call them the 12 essential services. Because when delivered comprehensively, these 12 have the power to eradicate hunger, improve health, and enhance cognition. Now, four, there are four services of the 12 that fall within each of these three categories. Eradicating hunger includes establishing school and household gardens, providing child nutrition, ensuring micronutrient supplementation, constructing improved fuel-efficient stoves. Improving health includes offering health, nutrition, and hygiene education preventing malaria, Zika, and dengue fever, providing deworming tablets, and present, prevent, presenting HIV, AIDS, and STDs education. <coughs> Enhancing cognition includes providing general education, promoting girls' education, establishing potable water and sanitation facilities, 
and offering psychosocial support at both school and at home. Now, it's important to note that these 12 services are interdependent. They are inextricably interrelated. The effectiveness of one depends upon the delivery of the other. For example, the best school facility available will not help hungry children learn because hungry children can't learn. But we know that school and household gardens can turn that around. However, even if a child is well fed, if parasitic worms get the food before the child does, it doesn't matter how nutritious the food is. But we know that there's a 25 cent tablet that if administered twice a year, cures this devastating condition. But even children who are well fed and worm free will still not learn if they're homesick with the child killer called diarrhea. Diarrhea is a feces to mouth disease. When children go to the bathroom and they do not wash their hands, too often they get sick and too often they don't get well. Diarrhea is a leading cause of death among children. But we know when parents and children are learned to wash their hands with soap and water, that diarrhea is greatly diminished and fewer children die. However, even if a community addresses all these issues, adequate education facilities, good food and nutrition, deworming, necessary hygiene practices, it still won't ensure that all children will realize their potential if girls don't go to school. But we know that when girls will go to school, when their parents encourage it, when there are bathroom facilities on the campuses, and when society recognizes the economic and social benefits of offering a full education to every child. So the principal takeaway of this is that the global community knows that delivering these 12 essential services comprehensively will guarantee that virtually every at-risk child can lead a full and productive life. The key is the first 1,000 days. All we need to do is to ensure that pregnant women, their infants and toddlers, receive sufficient food and nutrition and protection from infectious disease. When those children are educated, they will become contributing members of society. When all children are provided this opportunity, the positive global consequences will be enormous. Governments know this to be true. The United Nations knows this to be true. Universities, religious organizations, NGOs all over the world know this to be true. Some of you in this room tonight know this to be true. So what's preventing this from happening? The science is clear. Our intentions are noble. We've spent billions of dollars. We know what needs to be done. But although we've made progress, we've failed to get it done. With 800 million hungry and 26% of all children stunted, I think we must admit that we have failed to figure out how to take what we know and employ it comprehensively and at scale so that all will benefit. This is an unacceptable contradiction. Our children and their children cannot afford continuing failure. So what can be done? The primary barriers are money and people. As Dean Crocker said, Governments don't have enough of either. The missing and untapped resource is short-term volunteers. Volunteers solve both of these issues. If there's enough volunteers, that takes care of the, of the people issue. And volunteers cost very little because they pay their own way. So the power of volunteers changes everything. 
Global Volunteers engages everyone who is willing to volunteer. Students, faculty, professionals, retirees. We engage people from all walks of life. Nutritionists, obstetricians, farmers, child psychologists, masons, horticulturalists, nurses, ranchers, teachers, carpenters, pediatricians, hygienists, entrepreneurs, gardeners, pharmacists, lawyers, marketers, agronomists, students, professors, administrators, and anyone who speaks English as their primary language. In fact, we know it's possible to reach every at-risk child on the planet if only 2% of the population of the developed world volunteered for two weeks a year within a generation, all 12 essential services could be delivered to virtually every at-risk child on Earth. On Earth. So during the past four years, Global Volunteers has conducted a demonstration project in the Caribbean island of St. Lucia. There we've demonstrated that short-term volunteers are a vital resource to helping families and community organizations deliver the 12 essential services. In the small seaside village of Ansleray, our volunteers worked with local people on a comprehensive array of community projects that boost in, in, in nutrition, improves children's health, increases cognitive ability, and enhances school performance. Now we are expanding this effort. At the invitation of local and national leaders, we're taking the significant learnings from St. Lucia to the commun to communities in other parts of the world. For example, we've been invited by the president of Tanzania to develop demonstration projects in 100 villages in the south central part of the, organ of, of the country. There, in cooperation with our long-term host organization, the Lutheran Church of Tanzania, we hope to raise the money to utilize the learnings from St. Lucia. Now, 100 villages will require a lot of volunteers. But our goal is to demonstrate to governments and to other development organizations that this work can be done at scale and can be replicated in rural and urban communities around the world. So what do volunteers do? Volunteers help local people grow nutritious food. They, don't know, they donate earth boxes. Earth boxes are small, low maintenance container gardening systems that provide high quality fresh produce. In tropical climates, one earth box can produce all the fruits and vegetables needed by an adult, a teen, or two younger children for a full year. Equally important, they're easy to use. They can sit on a table, so you don't have to bend over to plant or harvest, which is very important if you're pregnant or elderly. They don't have to be weeded, because the growing medium is covered by a thin plastic mulch cover. They use 40% less water than standard irrigation systems. And they, when used properly, they will produce four to five times as much fruits and vegetables as the same amount of land in a shovel in the earth garden. Earth boxes literally are magic boxes. But in addition to helping grow food, Volunteer professionals join our local health care staff on home visits to women and their children. They offer health and nutrition information, and they offer support and friendship. This is a tremendously effective service conducted at home twice a week, week after week, and research reveals that when professionals make these types of visits, the children perform better in school than children who were not, did not receive this service. Volunteers also conduct hand washing with soap and water campaigns in schools, at community centers, and at health clinics. 
Washing hands with soap and water is 300 times more cost effective than any single vaccination. It helps keep pe children healthy, prevents stunting, and literally saves lives. Volunteer professionals conduct interactive workshops with local women. Topics range from staying healthy during pregnancy to breastfeeding, increasing earth box yields, preparing nutritious meals, playing with children to enhance their learning ability, learning how to protect children from infectious disease, treating infections, and so much more. All of these collectively reduce stunting. Volunteer business professionals help women create cooperatives. Now, most village women don't have sources of income, but they're motivated to earn money. And toward this end, volunteers teach basic business practices, bookkeeping, marketing, customer service. Volunteers work with two to five-year-olds in preschools. They bring their teaching experience, education, love, and care to the preschool setting. They mentor local preschool teachers and administrators and dramatically enhance the quality of the preschool learning experience. Volunteers teach conversational English, the international language of commerce, technology, and opportunity. Volunteers tutor reading and math and computer literacy at the primary and secondary school levels. They support teens at vocational schools, and volunteers get their hands dirty helping with community infrastructure projects, painting, maintaining, and repairing school buildings, classrooms, community centers, health clinics. And volunteers teach young men and women about STDs, pregnancy prevention, and how to be responsible parents. Every volunteer makes a significant difference in the lives of children. But this is not a one-way street. Tremendous value occurs, accrues to the volunteer as well. Travel in and of itself is a significant, offers a significant learning opportunity. But this is more, but more than just travel. Service learning in a community allows the volunteer to become a participant rather than just an observer or a tourist. And this can be an amazing learning experience that excites volunteers' passions for and fosters cur curiosity, humility, and innovative solutions to persistent problems at home. This is hands-on experiential learning. And it's great fun for everyone involved. Our success over the last 32 years is based upon the simple fact that local people must be in charge. Local people must initiate and conduct their own development efforts. Outsiders, whether they are government agencies, religious organizations, universities, or well-intentioned NGOs, cannot impose solutions for local challenges. Now, this can sometimes be difficult, especially for well-educated successful Americans. I remember working with a team of volunteers in Jonestown, Mississippi. We were building a community center. There were 12 volunteers and 12 local people working together. We had just completed building the floor. And Mr. Brown, he was the foreman on the project and a community leader, came over to me and said, I want you to put the door in the, main, in the center of the main wall. He took a piece of chalk, made a mark on the floor, center it there, he said. He turned around, walked away. I went and got my tape, started to measure. He caught me out of the corner of his eye because he came back and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm measuring for the center. And he said, I just showed you where the center was. Before I had a chance to say anything, he asked me, did you go to college? <laughs> I could tell by the tone of his voice that I should not elaborate, and so I simply said yes. And Mr. Brown said, you know, I thought so. I got a brother, 
He went to college too, and he don't know nothing either. <laughs> Later that evening, under the cloak of darkness, I went back and remeasured, and Mr. Brown was off by a half an inch. But it wouldn't have mattered if he was off by a foot or three foot, three feet, because it was his center. That is why local people are in charge. And to help us remember this, we follow six basic principles that guide our activities. The first is that we only go where we're invited. The second, we always work under the direction of local leaders. Third, we work on community-based projects that the community has determined important for their long-term development. And fourth, we work hand-in-hand -hand with local people. That reminds me of another story. We were in another US community, and the mayor was advising, briefing the volunteers one night on the local people with whom they were going to be working the following day. She told them they were going to be men from the local prison. But she didn't want them to be concerned, so she quickly added, but these are nonviolent criminals getting a day off uh, for prison for, for community service because of good behavior. The volunteers felt comfortable with that. But one of our volunteers missed the briefing. So the next morning, these guys show up. They're wearing their prison garb, bright green jumpsuits with an orange stripe down the sleeve, an orange stripe down the pant leg. And the volunteer who missed the briefing when she was introduced to one of these guys, she said, that's a really nice outfit. <laughs> well, the guy didn't know what to say, so he just said, thanks. And she asked, where'd you get that? <laughs> and he said, at the lockup. <coughs> and she asked, is that in the mall? <laughs> now, the reason I tell you that story is that it helps us remember that we always work with local people. We never do things for them. So the fifth principle, we only do that which we are asked to do. And six, we return to each community multiple times each year, year after year, as long as the community continues to invite us. I'll finish with a story that my former boss, US, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, likes to tell. He was in church one Sunday morning, and the priest, when the priest first came out, he gathered all the kids around him, all the children of, in the church around him, and he said he wanted to explain to them what the gospel was for the day. And Tom says that really perked him up, because sometimes he doesn't understand the sermon, and he thought, well, maybe he could better understand the explanation to the kids. So the priest explained the part of the gospel about the loaves and the fishes. A wonderful story. Now, regardless of your faith tradition, this is a wonderful story. So Jesus was teaching to the multitudes, and he realized that they were hungry. And so he called his apostles, and he said, go feed the people. And so they looked around and they gathered together five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. They looked at each other and said, there's no way we're feeding this group of people with this little food. Jesus recognized their hesitation. He said to them, have faith. Pass the baskets. So they passed the baskets. And all 500 were fed. In fact, when they gathered the baskets at the end, they had more food than when they started. So the priest explained it to the children this way. What Jesus did in that story is he removed the fear of sharing. That is what a community of people can do. By working together, each of us doing our small part, we remove from all of us the fear of sharing. When that fear is removed, we can become more generous 
with what we have, our time, our compassion, our creativity, our money, our skills. This is a powerful story. It says we can take what we have and go feed the people. All we need to do is remove the fear of sharing. And in the words of Anne Frank, how wonderful it is that no one need wait a single moment before they start improving the world. Thank you very much. Continue on the conversation. Oh, there I go. Now I'm mic'd up. So, uh, oh, that's what happened last time. I got to stay seated, or else I start to reverberate. Thank you, Bud. That was an. Uh, you've, you've laid out an interesting, impressive vision for the role of volunteers and what they can do in our society and what they can do in the world. And one of the one of my first reactions is where did where did you where did this come from? Where did this sort of idea of matching volunteers with the, the, the range of problems that you profiled there. Where did that idea come from? Where did that inspiration? Yeah, Will, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I was in a class earlier today, and a student asked me something similar to that. And it was, I explained it that it was, it, there wasn't any moment. It, it kind of happened over time. Um, I need to confess that uh, I'm really supposed to be a senator from the from state of Minnesota. That was that was Plan A. Um, well, now I'm on Plan Q or something. But uh, when we started Global Volunteers, it it, it for all practical purposes started by accident. Uh, my wife and I uh, served in a rural village in Guatemala on our honeymoon. When we got home, uh, she talked to a lot of her friends, her backgrounds in journalism, so a reporter from the Minneapolis Tribune did a story on us, put us on the front page of the Metro section. Lots of people read it, told us when they met, ran into us and asked us, you know, how would you do that? Who's your travel agent? I'd always like to do something like that. And so after that went on for six months or so, we decided maybe there's a market. I was at the Humphrey School at the time studying international development. I knew that there was a need. And so uh, we decided to do one trip a year for our friends. And it got out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> and now how many trips a year? Oh, it depends. Uh, I suppose we're, we do maybe 150, 200. Nice. What do you think has contributed to that growth or that sustained engagement and growth that you guys have seen? You have an impressive organization. Well, we were much Lots. larger before the recession. Okay. So uh, we're, but we've, we've got ourselves through the recession. And because volunteers pay to do this. So during the time of a recession, you can think about what are your priorities and unfortunately, this is pretty low on the list. Uh, but a number of people continued to volunteer through those years, enough to uh, keep us alive. We were cut approximately in half. Okay. Um, but we continue to grow now. And I think the reason for it is, is because, well, there's several reasons. One, people want to give back, particularly in this country. Not all of us, but most of us have been given so much. We are so fortunate that whether we give back in our own communities or we go to a developing community on an American Indian reservation or somewhere else in Appalachia in this country or we go abroad, we have a desire to give back. But people also want meaning in their lives. And making widgets all day or selling widgets all day or writing about widgets all day, for some people isn't enough, and they want more than that. And these kinds of 
volunteer experiences offer tremendous meaning. You you gave the example of the recession and, and what what is that the biggest what are the challenges, right? So you laid out an amazing vision, you say that we can go to scale, we can we can achieve this amazing uh, development. You had the slide of two weeks, if 2% uh, of the population gave two weeks. So what are the challenges for us to be able to get there? Well, I, I mean, the challenges to get to 2% are, are beyond my comprehension at the moment. The challenges just to running this organization are numerous. Um, you know, people don't, don't like to go places where people are shooting at each other. So if there's a U.S. State Department travel warning on a country, we have to end our, okay. stop our program there. After 9-11, uh, people flew uh, much less than they had previously for a time period. War is not good for the work that we do. There's all kinds of external <laughs> issues. We work with governments, oftentimes. And governments change, leadership changes. Um, but I think to move from where we are to where we can actually impact all of the children in the world that need these services, I think what needs to be done is that we need to demonstrate empirically that volunteers over a period of time can, in fact, reduce stunting. Stunting is understood to be one of the major issues plaguing the developing world. And so if we can demonstrate that we can reduce stunting, engaging short-term volunteers, then it's our view that governments and NGOs and universities will take note of that. And once people realize that there's, a, there's an actual solution to this enormous challenge, then the gates will open. There'll be new challenges, but the gates of volunteers if will If we open. can demonstrate the, the, the effectiveness of some yeah. of this work. You've got to demonstrate it empirically. And that's a little bit of what the St. Lucia project is about? The St. Lucia project was primarily about demonstrating to us okay. that well, volunteers could have an impact. And I don't know if folks may, may or may not be familiar with that <laughs> initiative. Just the, a little background. Sure. The St. Lucia project was... was uh, we started it in uh, 2012, actually early, late 2011. And the objective was to demonstrate that short-term volunteers could have an impact assisting families and community organizations <coughs> deliver the 12 essential services. Um, and from our purposes, we've demonstrated that. But we can't demonstrate a reduction in stunting because St. Lucia is only 179,000 people. And as they'll tell you, they've had two uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners, more per capita than any country in the world. So they don't have a stunting issue, and, and by rights they don't. But in a couple of their extremely impoverished communities, they do. But there's no baseline data for it. Okay. So in Tanzania, for example, the World Health Organization estimates or reports that 42% of all Tanzanian children are stunted and 50% of those that live in the rural are stunted. So you could see that if you worked in 10 villages or 100 villages and over a period of five or few years, it doesn't take long, that stunting significantly decreased. I don't mean by three or four or five percent. I mean if you cut it from 50% to 5%, It'd be pretty remarkable. Right. And it doesn't take long because it begins at the time of pregnancy. And as long as the mother, the expecting mother, gets sufficient food and nutrition and protection from infectious disease during those nine months, and her infants and toddlers get it through their second birthday, their brains are going to fully develop. So you will know within 33 months what, what were some of the things that you learned, though, through that St. Lucia project that, that, you, that you imagine now being able to move to, to communities that, that have even more substantive need? Yeah, one of the, one of probably the most important thing we learned was this, um, the value of volunteers and our local staff going from home to home on a routine basis 
to work with and support the moms, uh, either pregnant women or the new mothers and their children. They only stay with them for 45 minutes twice a week, but we found that to be very, very helpful. Now, that was not out of our playbook. Okay. That was somebody else's. We just adopted it. What we brought together was then bringing those moms into small groups, five, four, five, six people together, local moms together, with a professional, a volunteer professional. And in an interactive workshop, they would discuss, they discuss breastfeeding, or how to get a greater yield from your earth box, or how to prepare nutritious, the, the produce from, from the earth box uh, most nutritiously. And when volunteer professionals do that over and over again, they have the opportunity to change behavior. And that's what we learn, is that those two uh, particular activities are so remarkably effective. And those were things that you were not necessarily incorporating we weren't, consistently. We, we, right, that's right. We also learned about earth boxes. Right. I didn't know about earth boxes until I was at USDA. And so we started them in St. Lucia first. Uh, we never impose anything and sometimes don't even suggest things. So we were invited by the Catholic Church and we put five earth boxes in the churchyard. Uh, we told the priest he could have all the produce. That sounded good to him. One of the church uh, attendants took care of them. And so people would walk to, on Sunday morning, they'd, they'd go to church and they'd see all the fruits and vegetables. And it wasn't long before women were asking, how could we get one of those earth boxes? And so we started training the women in how to plant uh, take care of and harvest earth boxes. And now, every time I go back there, I'm not accosted exactly, but the women want to know when will I get more earth boxes. <laughs> I only have two, but my family needs three, or I only have three and my family needs four. They have found that this is a remarkable source of food, easy to do, not a lot of work. It's almost like free food in the sense that they're growing it. What is the role of local volunteers in trying to get some of the materials, some of the supplies that are needed, like food, earth boxes, or, or other things, pipes, or any variety of things, building supplies? What's the role of, of global volunteers in that? We supply some uh, modest amount of uh, financial support. When it comes to something like an earth box, you can only buy it in the US. So we buy them here, we ship them, we think the government's going to sign off in the next week or two so we don't have to pay duty on them anymore. Um, so we provide the boxes. You do. But the boxes last for 25, 30 years. So at 150 bucks, I mean, just do the math. 150 bucks for an earth box when you include everything, the shipping, the, 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 all the pieces. And you get three to four crops out of them a year. And they last for... 30 years, well, 30 into 150 means you're spending $5 a year, and three crops a year, you can do the math. I mean, it's less than a dollar a crop. So the, it's, hmm. they're, they're very efficient. So you do try to provide some of those supplies when you're doing something. Oh, yes, that work. yeah. If the supplies are not available in country, we will supply them. Most, that's seldom the case, however, and so we always purchase the the supplies within country. So a question from the audience was having to do with consistency of volunteers, right? So you gave a great story of visiting families or, or giving these educational classes. How do you, what do you do for consistency? How do you make sure that the quality of the interactions are, are, are consistent? From, well, we have from a lot one, of, one week to the next, right? We have a lot of faith. <laughs> we have a lot of faith. Some volunteers are better than others. Some volunteers are more skilled than others. Some volunteers are able to do this more readily than others. But every volunteer makes a difference. We do prepare them, we do vet them, we do provide them uh, materials in advance. We have orientation sessions. We meet, we have meetings with them every day. They're in a team, we function as a team, so these aren't people just off on their own. Um, they're organized, um, but the local people are always in charge, so they're the ones that are determining what's being done. 
And if a volunteer, for example, is doing the home visits, mm -hmm. and one of the local staff says this isn't working, then politely she will be reassigned to a different project. I say she because 70% of our volunteers are women. It's easier to say it that way. Um, but, but that's how it, it's, okay. it's just a human process. And what guides you as in, in, in this leadership role that you've played? You're passionate about this work. You're passionate about this idea of getting people into these communities. Yeah, well, that's a that's a personal question. Yeah, I'll end, I'll try I, shifted, to I shifted it. <laughs> <laughs> so we all have our own um, faith beliefs, or or not thereof. Um, my view is really very simple. I believe that upon my death, I have to go eye to eye with the Creator. And when he or she asks me, what'd you do for my children? I don't want to go hubba, hubba, hubba. I want to have an answer. And so that's what drives me. I don't get that question very often. <laughs> I see Lori moving there. Maybe we'll. Well, how does one follow that answer? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. We have a small plaque, which is suitable for packing <laughs> to uh, allow Bud to take it with him. And I'd like to invite him to stand so as we can make sure that he, in fact, receives the plaque. Thanking you very much for your contributions this evening and for coming here and making such a wonderful presentation thank and you. really inspiring as well. Thank, thank you, Lori. I appreciate it very much. And, and from the, my sincerest heart felt thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Will. Good night.